Welcome to class with Professor Mead. Let's get started. So our think pair share for today, um, we're going to talk about what the primary purposes of social institutions, social structures are, um, what those definitions are, and then we're going to talk about these things from a conflict perspective, a functionalist perspective, um, a symbolic interactionist perspective, and then we're going to give examples and talk about how interpersonal um, interaction actually constructs reality. So quite hefty today. Um, the first thing that we want to talk about is the difference between macro sociology and micro sociology. So macro and micro sociology um, are the different perspectives of analysis. Macro is going to be large scale and micro is going to be small scale. Um, or detailed perspective, right? So I have a visual here for you. You can look at the forest, right? Or you can look at the trees themselves and do an analysis um, of the, the detail within it, each individual tree, or you can stand back and look at the trees as a forest and as a whole. Um, that's the difference between macro and micro. We just apply it to society. The two theories that are going to be macro, which is this should actually be um, the second time you're hearing this and learning this, so it's very important. The two theories that are macro are conflict perspective and, some, and functionalist perspective. Conflict perspective is associated with Karl Marx and structural functionalism, functionalist perspective, is associated with Durkheim. Micro sociology is social interaction, right? Taking the analysis from a symbolic interactionist perspective, you can look at individual interaction, you can look at social structure group patterns, on, especially on a small scale. Um, you can look at social structures and how they guide your behavior based on your social location or group location, and that's time, place, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's talk about some macro level perspectives, specifically some of the terms that are used in when doing analysis of society or in sociology in general. Um, and the first one that we want to talk about is social structure. A social structure, the term definition, is a typical pattern of group of a group that guides behavior. Um, that's kind of a vague general term, but when we talk about a social structure within a society, what we mean is that there are typical patterns either through norms or through institutions that um, guide our behavior. We kind of know how to act based on whether we fit into a particular um, archetype and being maybe male or female, or if we're in a particular setting. Um, like within an institutional setting, like when you go to work, you act one way. When you go to school, you act another way. Uh, when you go to a concert, you act a different way, right? So a social structure is that within society, right? That guides those typical behaviors. It's very close to the definition of social institutions, which is why you will hear them used interchangeably a lot of the times, but it's just ever so slightly different because a social structure doesn't imply that there is some type of institution in the background that is guiding that um, typical behavior, right? A social institution sets the context for your behavior and for your orientation to life. It even shapes the way you think about things. Um, you're gonna think about something differently if it's in a particular setting or if it's based on expectations or norms or values within your society. So when we talk, we'll talk later about social institutions but that's the more connected one to those different types of institutions like um, the economy or um, organized religion, that type of thing. Different types of social structures, though, that we have in our society are things like social class and social stratification. Those are two forms of a social structure, right? So your, your social class has to do with a variety of things, not just your income, but also things like the type of occupation that you have, how much prestige it has, your education, who you're married to, right? Their income, education, and prestige, those types of things. That's all encompassed in your social class. Um, sociologists use socioeconomic status 
as a, a clear concept that would define social class in a way that they can do analysis because it includes things specifically in the definition. Social stratification is just simply that higher, higher, hierarchical arrangement, excuse me, see, even I have a tough time sometimes um, pronouncing things, um, but it's that arrangement of hierarchy in society that we see, whether we agree with it or not, whether we believe it in it, in it or not, right, but it exists, it's there. It is where you stand on that ladder of social class based on how many access, how much access to resources that you have. So the more access to resources that you have, the higher you are in the social stratification ladder, right? In the hierarchy. And the less access to resources that you have, the lower you are. So you can see how things like race, class, gender, um, able-bodiedness, all of those things can impact where you fall in that hierarchical arrangement. Okay, so this is simply a set of terms that you need to know. They're all pretty easy. Um, I recommend simply just saying these out loud, going over them with somebody that you know. So let's go through them quickly. Status is any position that a person occupies, right? So um, I'm a mom. I'm a daughter, I'm a teacher, all of those are statuses. A status set is the collection of all of those different things, right? So I'm a female teacher who is heterosexual. That is a status set. A scribe statuses are only those statuses in which you didn't do anything to achieve it. It's not necessarily whether it's bad or good, but it's just if you didn't do anything to achieve it. So your race is an ascribed status. Your sex is usually an ascribed status. Um, those kinds of things. Being a daughter, that's an ascribed status. However, being a mother is an achieved status because you actually had to do something to achieve that status, right? You had to have a child. Um, your job is an achieved status, but if you were a criminal, that's also an achieved status because you actually did something to achieve it. So it's not complicated, it's just which one falls where, right? Status symbols are the different type of symbols that you use to gain recognition. Some people um, like to, some, some people like to show that they have money. It's like really important for them to have those status symbols of wealth, even if they don't have um, wealth. But all kinds of things are status symbols that you wouldn't necessarily recognize or you don't normally think of, right, as a status symbol. Um, and so things like a wedding ring, wearing a wedding ring is a status symbol. Um, the quality of your teeth is a status symbol. All of these things are different types of status symbols, and they can vary based on where you're located, your social location, the social context, right? So what can be a status symbol in one place may have a different status um, context if you move locations. Uh, your master status is the status that cuts across all other statuses. You often don't have control of this. Normally, this status is going to be one where you're in the subordinate group, not in the dominant group. So say, for example, um, I'm a white male doctor, but I'm in a wheelchair. That wheelchair, that, you know, not being able-bodied, quote unquote, is going to be, I don't know why that would be, quote unquote, um, and I'm not going to edit that out either. <laughs> um, that being not being able-bodied uh, would be a master status because you're the doctor who is in a wheelchair, right? Whether you go to the grocery store, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, you're always that person in the wheelchair. It's cut across all of your other statuses. Um, so that one's a little bit more difficult. A status inconsistency, this is my favorite one, because this is when you have two different statuses that don't go together. So on a very simple one would be, I'm married, not me, but I am married, but this is not a personal example. I'm a married person who has lots of sexual partners, right? That would be a status inconsistency. Um, 
again, technically not me, right? Because I'm not status inconsistent in that way. Another one is uh, an example that my story that my mom told me many years ago. Um, and so this is my favorite example to use. And that's, um, there was, she grew up in Mexico in Ensenada. And there was this old man who lived on the streets and he had, you know, his clothes and his blankets and stuff like that. And when he died, they um, they went to go get rid of all of his clothes and he had always worn this huge leather trench coat type of jacket. And apparently the whole thing was lined with money. So he was like super wealthy, but he lived on the street. He would leave his jacket everywhere too. Like nobody knew it had money in it. Um, but that's a status inconsistency. We wouldn't expect somebody to live like they're homeless and um, be wealthy or well-to-do, right? I do do that one as well, by the way, because I travel all the time and I'll live out of my vehicle um, and I don't care that I'm roughing it. Like I sincerely rough it a lot. Um, I obviously have a home and I, you know, and I have enough money to get a hotel if I really wanted to um or to you know just be at home but people do sometimes think i'm homeless when i'm traveling and um, just because you know i'll live in like the you know i'll go camping in the mountains for like two or three weeks and then come out of the mountains like all dirty um and you know just looking like i've lived in the mountains for two weeks um, so that's a status inconsistency as well roles that one's another easy one um these are the roles that people ex the behaviors people expect of you based on the role that you act occupy so if you're a mom people expect you to do things like feed your kid and take care of your kid and clean your house right um if you are a student people expect you to go to school and do homework and that kind of stuff um so that's just a role that's easy i think these are easy um, some of my status symbols include, um, just so that I'm giving you example, I want you to do this as well, um, cause this helps you remember them. Um, they're easy to learn, but you have to remember all of them, right? For the exam. Um, so I own a ton of books, um, obviously, right? I'm a dorky, nerdy professor, sociology professor. Um, I have nice teeth. Um, I've had a lot of dental work done on them. I technically don't have nice teeth because um, I've had to have so much work on them, but you know, that, you know, I just, it looks like I have nice teeth, right? I could afford to have dental work done on them. Um, being a professor is a status symbol. Ironically, the status symbol of me being a professor, um, my husband uses it more than I do. He works in constructions and even though he's like an inspector, he, um, likes to tell people that his wife is a professor whereas i'm like whatever it doesn't matter right i so i don't think of it much as a status symbol even though it is but it's actually kind of a status symbol for my husband because in his field um a lot of people you know aren't married to people who are like academically inclined or you know basically nerds so think about it for yourself what are some of your status symbols Okay, so let's talk about now the social institutions. So we're getting a little bit of a repeat because I want you to connect social institutions and social structures, right? So I put them in both places. But here I give you the examples of the different types of social institutions, uh, mass media, military, science, law, politics, medicine, economy, education, religion, and family. I did it from the bottom up. Um, we can understand when we talk about how um, as a social institution, uh, some kind of institution that will set the context for your behavior and the way you orientate yourself to life, right? We get it when we talk about like the military, that's completely obvious. Um, I also think that we kind of understand it as well in terms of mass media, right? Because we understand how much it influences us, religion as well. Um, family is one that's hard, I think because when we think institution, we connect institution in our brain to like a building, right? And family, we don't think of it like a building. It's not your family. It's the concept of family, right? So even that you know, you understand that your family may not be a nuclear family, a heteronormative nuclear family, we understand the concept of family can include 
other people than just a heteronormative nuclear family, right? Um, but that is the social institution. So our society, our culture, our norms, our values, even our mores and laws have been set up for um, non-interracial, um, heteronormative nuclear families as the ideal type. And we've even, you know, tried to prevent people from creating other types of families, right? It's setting the context for your orientation to life, but also for your behavior by maybe specifically not even allowing you um, to act in another way because we're putting laws around it. And so you connect that to what the social structure are and you can see it you can see how that institution right the social institution um, can be looked at as a typical pattern within our group behavior and so a social structure is a typical pattern um, and those come primarily out of our family, which is what we call a primary group in sociology. So the primary group is simply the group that provides your first orientation to life. It's the first people who help you socialize into norms and values and mores of society. As you get older um, and you're able to understand that it's not just you and specifically somebody else individually within your family that matter, but that there's also this broader context of understanding, um, you start to evaluate yourself through what we call reference groups. Um, so reference groups set up through social institutions um, are going to allow you to evaluate yourself in context to your peers. So if you think about it, it's like you think about other people your age or other people in your community or other people who are going to your same, you know, um, in, within your same educational level um, and you start to use them as a reference group. Okay, am I keeping up? Am I ahead of them? Am I behind them? Right? We start to evaluate ourselves. Um, my, you know, friends are going to college, but I'm not, or um, I've had a child, but they haven't, right? That's your reference group. Not hard, right? Um, so our concept of society, now this is obviously macro level, right? So our concept of society is, and our definition of in sociology, any people who share language, culture, or geography. Now, ironically, this is the same exact definition that biologists use when they talk about race. When biologists talk about race, they actually mean people who share language, culture, and geography. That's how they define race. In sociology, that's how we define society. So a few examples historically of different types of societies um, and then through to the modern times. So hunting gathering societies are now they're defined based on their um, connection to the how we make a living right to the mode of production of society. That's how we define these different types of societies. So a hunting gathering society is a society that survives through gathering food and hunting animals. Um, and then we know today women gathered about 80% of the food and men hunted and they contributed about 20% of the food. So the women brought in the majority of food within hunting and gathering societies. In pastoral and horticultural societies, um, you have um, pasture animals and and you know a beginning of starting to work with the land in terms of um, you know manipulating plants and that kind of thing. Agricultural societies are farming societies. The majority of people make their living through farming, right? They survive through farming is an agricultural society. Industrial society, the majority of people make their living through um, working in a factory or in a coal mine or something to that effect, right? Think industrial revolution. Post-industrial societies, that's the one where at the end, the tail end, we're still in a post-industrial society, also known as an information society. 
Um, and we're at the tail end of a post-industrial society and we're starting to move into what's called a biotech society. So a post-industrial information society is where the majority of people um, provide some kind of service and that's how they make their living, that's how they survive. For example, I'm a teacher, so I'm providing a service. I'm in the service economy, truly. If you're an accountant, if you're a doctor, if you're a salesperson, all of those are service economy based, right? And that's the majority of people make their living through some, providing some type of service. We're in an in information society, a service economy. The, where we're moving is what we call a biotech society. I don't know a ton about biotech societies, but basically what it means is that um, the majority of people will be making their living through um, biotechnology types of services. So think GMO situations, right? Where um, you're editing um, genetically modifying food and in, within that industry, um, you know, those types of industries are biotech societies. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how Emil Durkheim uh, views society and some of the terminology that he knows. Now, Emil Durkheim is macro or micro level sociology? You should be thinking macro level sociology. He's associated with structural functionalism, right? So some of the terms that we want to talk about today, social integration, mechanical and organic um, solidarity, division of labor, alienation, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, those are, I believe, German terms, and I'll explain them in a little bit. So theoretically, um, what Durkheim says is that members of a society, because they share their norms, their values, and their mores, they are socially integrated. And the more that you share norms, values, and mores, the more socially integrated that you are. Um, when you lack social integration into society, it's called anomy. You are basically lacking that connection. The more you connect with other members within your community, your family, religious organizations, work and education, those are all ways in which we become socially integrated into our society. Um, it helps us to become conforming members of society. Um, and it helps the society to run calmly and efficiently to be socially integrated. Um, and there's two different types of solidarity that we have with other community members. Um, there's mechanical and orga organic solidarity. Now I put a visual for you because I think it helps. This is a little bit of a more complex theoretical term or concept. Um, so for many people, visual aids are very important because we all have different learning styles. Most of us are not auditory learners. Most of us have some combination. So um, mechanical solidarity is people who basically perform the same or similar task, they start to develop a shared consciousness. You've probably experienced this. Have you ever like hung out with somebody that you worked with and then you kind of just complain together or vent about work and the things maybe that customers do or that you know the boss does? You guys do the same job so you can understand from the same perspective. Whereas you try to talk to somebody who doesn't do that job, they just kind of look at you blankly like whatever, right? You need to just get over it. Um, they don't have shared solidarity, mechanical solidarity with you, so they can't see it from your perspective. Organic solidarity is when individuals perform different tasks, um, but they're interdependent upon each other. So we often think of ourselves as um, completely independent from each other because we have different jobs. But within, even within the United States, within our society, all of the jobs that we have from a functionalist perspective are interdependent upon each other and therefore we depend on each other. You need somebody to be a doctor, but you also very much need people to be trash men, right? Those are all very important um, aspects of a society, but let's take it down and make it a little bit more micro so that it's easier to understand. Um, 
in your family, your mom and your dad and you might all have different jobs within the household, whether that's bringing in um, different types of income or uh, doing the domestic labor within the house um, or um, you know, who takes, you know, who dividing up the labor, like how it's divided up, right? You might all do different tasks, but you have organic solidarity because you all depend on each other to make your family and your home function so that you guys can all do well together. So that's interdependence, right? Organic solidarity. Um, division of labor, I've already actually used the term, right, is when you specialize in some kind of specific type of work. Um, we often say division of labor between the sexes, right? We divide the labor. That one's a pretty clear one. Um, but within America and the United States in general, we all tend to specialize in a job and we divide the labor of society up um, into a bunch of specializations. And that's division of labor. Um, so that we can work together and create a society that is functional as the as a whole. When you start to become um, cut off from the finished product of your work, um, it's called alienation. You're alienated from your labor. Uh, the best example that I always think of that's the most relatable to me, it's on a micro level. When I cook for myself and my family, the result of my cooking, my labor, right, is extremely important to me because I'm going to eat it. But if I was cooking for masses of people that I didn't know and I'm being paid minimum wage to do so and I'm exhausted and I'm tired and it doesn't matter if that first meal comes out the same or better or worse than that last meal, um, I'm alienated from my labor. Right. So we we have that kind of example for us in modern day. He was talking about it more like, you know, you're a cobbler, you're a dressmaker, um, you know, you're a baker. Right. So they if you made those things for yourself or if you own the company in which you are selling them, right, you make the shoes that you sell. Um, you're not alienated from your labor. This is your labor that you are, you know, showing to people, right? So there's a connection, there's a pride there. If you are just selling shoes you bought from China, you're alienated from that labor. The, it doesn't matter to you, right? The quality, it's not a reflection of your skill or who you are. Um, and then the last two are Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. So Gemeinschaft is intimate community and Gesellschaft is in personal association. So intimate community is people who are in your business within your community, Gemeinschaft, they're in my business. This is gonna be a hard one to remember, but you need to remember it. Gesellschaft, I don't know people. Think big, massive market where people are selling things. Gesellschaft, it's impersonal. Gemeinschaft, it's intimate, right? So it's intimate into my community. So let's talk about that for a second. A good example of Gemeinschaft, an intimate community where everybody is in everybody's business is the Amish. Now the Amish are a great example of Gemeinschaft communities um, today because we don't see these as often, right? So they have both mechanical and organic solidarity. While they divide their labor by sexes quite extremely, where the men do most of the outdoor labor and the women do most of the indoor labor, they understand and still even talk about how they're interreliant on each other, even though they're highly divided in their labor, they have organic solidarity. But they also, all the women and all the men tend to do the same type of work. Here on the right, you see a barn raising. Here, a bunch of neighbors are helping somebody whose um, wagon has tipped over, right? So they have mechanical solidarity. They all work into the same um, they all do the same type of work, so they all understand from the same perspective. Plus, they're always in each other's business, and that's what makes them Gemeinschaft. They know what everybody's doing, so that's why they're such a great example of this. They are also not alienated from their labor. Um, you know, the, the 
pies that she's making are for her community or for her to sell and the um, barn that they're raising is for a community member they build they all get together as a community and build a house for the next person who needs it so they're not alienated from their labor and they have almost no real not a strong sense of anomie which means that they are very socially integrated into their society gemeinschaft okay so i guess it's time to talk about micro level sociology um, and so micro level focuses on everyday interaction this is the one associated with symbolic interactionist perspective um, and there's a couple um, associated theorists, Mead being one of them. Um, and when we talk about micro sociological perspective, we're often talking about everyday interactions or what we might call um, face to face interactions. Um, and so in the intro textbook, they kind of start talking about giving an example of stereotypes in everyday life um, and how assumptions can be essentially self-fulfilling, right? So things that we do where we interact every single day construct the reality in which we live in. Um, things like personal space, like how much personal space people within society give you um, starts to create the reality of how much personal space is appropriate um, to give other people. So if you live in a society where there's a, a small level of social personal space, you are going to stand closer to other people who, um, even if you're in a different society where they have different personal space issues, by the way, in the United States, personal space tends to be somewhere between 18 and 21 inches. So if you reach out your hand, that's typical um, personal space. Now, in, now we're trying to get people to stand six feet apart, right, because of the pandemic. Um, in Texas, it tends to be around three feet. Um, and then in, you know, some Asian countries, typically in any country that has a high population where everybody's crowded in, it tends to be lower. It tends to be somewhere between 12 and 16 inches or 10 and 16 inches. Um, but things like eye contact, smiling, body language, all of these are symbolic interactionist things. The behaviors that we do and we see recreate what's expected as the norms and the values. Think about it this way. Um, in your family, usually ask the whole class, right? And I can't ask you guys and we can't see your answers, but you can at least think about yours. Um, usually um, in a culture, when you're being reprimanded by your parent, you're supposed to do one or two things, make eye contact or absolutely not make eye contact. In some cultures, making eye contact means that you're paying attention. So when you're being lectured, you're supposed to make eye contact. And that's very much true in American culture. In other cultures, making eye contact is, you know, being authoritative. So if you make eye contact when you're being, um, when you're being punished or lectured, you're basically being antagonistic, you're fighting back, right? So you're supposed to look down or look at the ground, right? To be submissive. So all of these things recreate our reality. There are face-to-face -face interactions and they create our everyday life. Um, one of the good examples of this is also Irving Goffman. Um, so he talks about dramaturgy and dramaturgy is how you present yourself in everyday life, right? So are you, um, how do you act? when you go out in public versus when you're in your home versus when you're in your room by yourself, right? So he calls this front stage back and backstage behavior um, and that we are constantly making efforts to create an impression of ourselves, whether that's front stage or backstage. Um, the way that you dress and the way that you act and how you interact with other people that's often outside of the home is often front stage behavior. Uh, just think about like what you wear in general. I don't change what I wear much, by the way, even for these videos. I did put earrings on today, but I don't wear makeup. Um, but 
how many of us will put like real real clothes on when we go outside right we'll put on like a pair of pants jeans and a blouse or shirt or whatever the second we come home we put our pajamas on right that's front stage and backstage behavior we're putting on clothes because we're managing our impression of our you know the impression others have of us but when we get home we want to be comfortable and we're less concerned with the impression that the people within our home have of us because they know us right so that's front stage and backstage behavior. And he says um, what happens sometimes is that we can have what is called role conflict or role strain. So role conflict is when you literally have two different roles that are pulling you in two different directions. We talked about this actually um, in Sociology of Family last week um, in terms of something called familialism. So familialism can cause it's it's the familialism the definition is when it's a sociological term to talk about your how you're expected to behave to and um, the loyalties that you're supposed to have to your family and when that's really really high um, the level of it essentially is what we term familialism right so um, for many like Hispanic women, especially, we have a lot of role strain in terms of the um, expectations and our responsibilities as daughters or mothers um, to our family and then what we're expected to do in school. So usually they're talking about familialism for young women, right, where they're expected to take care of their families, do all the cooking and all the cleaning, maybe drive people around, be an interpreter, but also go to college and get good grades and study. And those things can be um, cause real strain because those two things can be conflicting on each other. Um, role conflict is when you simply can't do both at the same time. So say for example, um, trying to think of a good example. I was thinking of, of being a patient, right? So you have an appointment, you're an employee and a patient. Um, so you need to go to work and be at work Monday through Friday, nine to five. But you also need to be able to um, go to the doctor and they will only take appointments Monday through Friday, nine to five. So you literally can't do those two roles at the same time. You can either go to the doctor or go to work. That's role conflict, right? Or say, for example, um, your teacher is expecting you to be there for a final exam, but you also have an entrance exam to an, another college and they're at the exact same time. That's role conflict. Role strain is when you're pulled in two different directions and it's really challenging, but you can probably do both at the same time. You can be an employee and go to college um, at the same time. Um, it's just not easy, right? It's role strain. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is ethnomethodology. Do you want to try to say it? Ethnomethodology. I know you can say it. Don't just pretend like you did and don't do it. Um, so an ethnomethodology is a type of research that we do, usually in sociology. And it's the study of how people use common sense to make sense of their life or to understand their life around them. A lot of, um, not traditions, but superstitions, um, actually come from common sense ideas. Uh, the the malojo, like having the evil eye, the bracelets, or putting a blanket over a baby in um, Hispanic culture, that, that has a derivative in our understanding that something can affect babies when they're very young, right? Um, so the evil eye or putting a blanket over a baby is to keep strangers from coming and talking to your baby or touching your baby. Um, and then making them sick. Um, and so they call it, they, the superstition says it's the evil eye, right? So that was before people understood germs. Germs weren't reality, by the way, and they're still not reality in every culture. Um, so we have a hard time understanding this concept that this invisible thing that's so tiny can make us very ill. And so a lot of cultures have like, um, 
superstitions that have some, some kind of fact in their understanding or how they're making sense of their life. Um, and and it, some root in reality, even though they don't. So it becomes kind of real in their consequences, um, even though it doesn't have to be real. So um, when you talk about something like um, the superstition of the evil eye, where you are preventing or putting a blanket over a baby, um, you're preventing that germ, even though you didn't know that was real. In the book, they use an example of a watermelon where she, um, the author of this book, she goes and she's visiting another country and this guy is cutting watermelon and selling it. And she goes to buy a watermelon and she had seen him drop the knife into the water that the animals had been stepping in and going to the bathroom in and stuff. And he just wiped it on his pant leg and then was like, do you want me to cut your watermelon? She's like, no, I'm good. Because in her reality, there's germs. In his reality, it's clean, right? So we can kind of see how if somebody defines something as being real, it becomes real in its consequences. That's the social construction of reality. If I think that there's an evil eye that that can infect my baby and make them sick, um, when my baby gets sick after being touched by somebody, that's the reality because it's socially constructed that way. It does come from something real, but it doesn't have to, right? When we say the social construction of reality and our definition of, of that is subjective to us, that's what we call the Thomas theorem. And that means that we create the reality in which we live, both through our definitions, but also through our interactions with others. A good example of that in modern culture today is um, what we do on social media. We create these definitions as real and we'll even change things around to make them reality. Um, but we also limit who we talk to most of the time so that we don't ever hear the other side of the perspective, right? All of our, all of our friends and people on social media usually share the same perspective um, or we follow people who only share the same perspective on YouTube. Um, or um, by creating, by interacting with those people, it's like a feedback loop, right? And so we create this reality. We think everybody thinks like us um, because we're creating that feedback loop, right? We're constructing our own reality. Ethnomethodology. Oh, okay. So what I want you to do today, and obviously I can't hold you to this, but I would like you to either talk to somebody in your family or please actually choose somebody in your group, call them on the phone, I know you don't wanna do this, and just answer the questions. Because we need to, these aren't um, difficult um, concepts, but I want you to be able to verbalize and have a conversation with somebody. Just the fact that you do that is going to increase your chance of remembering this information from somewhere between 20 and 30 percent to about 80 to 90 percent when you just talk to somebody. So this is a workshop that is like of your own like honors system here, right? So phone discussion workshop, what roles do you perform with in your group? Answer these questions and then talk about um, your social statuses. I gave you mine and then I want you to try to give examples of these. Um, I can't tell you how much that would help you if you do it. So this is your writing workshop. Uh, we, I used to call them writing workshops. This is your discussion questions for the week, your study guide questions that go in the discussion board, but also should be part of your PowerPoint that's actually due pretty soon. And that's it for today. Um, I'm gonna sign off as your reluctant YouTube professor.